I don't know if everybody goes through recovery. I think everybody probably does because of the nature of the disease. What's happening is that your mind is being reconstructed. What we see to be the effects of the fear of life, which we are certain is a kind of a autoimmune disease that comes from the arising of, of fearfulness very early in life, so that the, the psychology, which is the mind, arises and develops in an atmosphere that assumes that there's something wrong here. So that all of the habits of desire and aversion, all the habits of what I can do to get what I want and what, I, what do I want and how can I get what I want and so forth, everything whatsoever that constitutes the mind that has appeared within the context of fearfulness and anxiety, all of those algorithms, and really it's, it's more accurate to call them algorithms than anything else, these are psychological mechanisms that come into being and are programmed to assume that they are there to protect you from a life that is uh, untrustworthy and dangerous and probably not worth living. That's what your mind is before you uh, do the looking. Your mind is this conglomeration of psychological algorithms that are out to protect you from, well, yourself mostly. Now, this isn't magic. I mean, the, the disease is, is cured in the moment of the looking, bringing your attention to what it feels like to be you. That that cures the disease. And, you know, you can make a case that that makes sense because there you are having had the direct experience of you and there's nothing happening there. There's no misery. There's no, it's just you, just a very plain and simple and uncomplicated, subtle feeling that you have touched. And since there, it's obvious that that feel of you isn't in danger at all, that the whole, you know, the whole project of protecting you from the danger of your life is invalidated and the disease is gone and it won't come back, it just won't. Believe me, if it could have come back, it would have come back with me during the recovery. So it won't come back. The disease is cured, but the symptoms are still there. The whole, the entire army of psychological algorithms that have come into being conditioned to protect you from your own life are still there doing their job, hoping, trying to keep you from harm, trying to, to lead you to pleasure, trying to do a number of conflicting things that make everything just kind of crazy. They're still there. Now, I can say with confidence, because of Carla and my own experience, that no matter what you do, you will come out the other end with all of those fearful algorithms having been evaporated and a new set of algorithms, psychological algorithms, that are not contaminated with the fear will take their place over time, no matter what you do. Whether you, um, you know, try to work with your attention or don't work with your attention, sooner or later the outcome will be the same. What I am suggesting in, the, in what I am saying about the usefulness and the, the correct use of attention during the misery of recovery is that when we talk about it and write about it in the forums and so forth, it can seem to the person receiving it, especially a person that is in the throes of recovery from this terrible disease, it can seem that this is one choice among many, that well, this might be a good one, but maybe this one over here is good too. Maybe I could just meditate a little bit and that'll be good too. Maybe I can go out and get drunk and that'll be good too. But this possibility of actually taking charge of your relationship with your own life is the only thing that works. Now, as I've said, in time, the recovery period will be over and you will find yourself satisfied and at home in your own life. No matter whether you 
do as I suggest to you with uh, learning how to control where you put your attention or not. It'll all work its way out. But here in this time of recovery, you have the unique opportunity to do something that, so far as I can see, nobody else has ever suggested to you. And that is to learn what deserves your attention and what does not deserve your attention. To learn something about the truly unique nature of the effect of your attention on the circumstances that are present within your mind and your life. The only thing that you can do is move your attention. There is nothing else. Everything else that appears in your consciousness is there already before you can do anything about it. Every mood, every pain, every pleasure, every everything that is present, that you see to be present in your mind at this time, in your life at this time, is already here. And there's nothing whatsoever you have to say about it. I mean, you can try to figure out how to mitigate the bad or how to enhance the good and so forth and so on, but if you look at the poor results from that kind of thing, you should be able to see that whatever it is we've been doing, it hasn't been helping. Whatever it is we've been doing, trying to make ourselves satisfied and at home in our lives, whatever we've been doing about that, it hasn't worked. It just hasn't worked. And this does. Like nothing else. This does. First, get rid of the fear. And that's the easiest part of it. And it is of no fundamental consequence to looking at yourself. It isn't like a spiritual or a magical thing. It's just you looking at yourself. Just you. It's just you. Nothing special. Just you. And once the disease is gone, then finally for the first time, you find yourself in a situation where you actually can decide to determine for yourself what you attend to, rather than just attending to whatever calls you, good, bad, or indifferent. And if I could just get everybody to understand that one thing, I think I would have done a, a really good job in this life. Just understand that one thing, that there's nothing you can do about what's happening except determine for yourself what you attend to.